welcome everybody for this lunch version of uh, Solving Embedded Linux Mysteries. And thanks for the uh, live embedded event organizers and team and uh, program panel for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here with such uh, an illustrious like um, company. I mean, the speaker panel is just awesome. And I'm like just trying to fit in. But I think... Um, I have something to bring, and this is mostly aimed at like newcomers or people who have ju are just like getting into embedded Linux. So this is essentially like a fail talk about all the things that I did wrong when I started, uh, which is like, okay, quite some years ago. But essentially, yeah, um, let's go through, uh, through my ride, wherever I fell over, and then you hopefully can avoid those same... Uh, problems. So, click. Um, does anybody know uh, the sources of Prentice? You can like make funny reactions. Probably no. Okay. So, ah, one, one, some, at least two people know the sources of Prentice. So, for all the others who don't know it, it's actually like a very, very famous um, German poem, but one of the most famous German um, poets ever namely Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And it roughly goes like this. Um, the sorcerer's apprentice lives with his master, and one day the master leaves him alone. And so the sorcerer's apprentice goes like, ah, oh, yeah, there's, there's all these chores I have, to, I have to do, but I don't feel like it. And, and I'm so good at doing magic by now, I, I can do it all by myself. So the most... The chore he wants to get rid most of is obviously like taking a bucket and head off to get water because his master ordered him to prepare a bath. So he and uh, he gets out his wand and he enchants a broom and says like, um, broom, you ought to go and fetch water for me. And yeah, it kind of works. I mean, the, the, the broom develops two arms and then just wanders off and gets water, which is, which is awesome, like, right? Mission accomplished. We could actually stop here. But um, you might have guessed it. It actually did backfire. Because once the, the bath tube was full, the broom wouldn't stop. It was just like, bring more water. And bring even more water. And more and more water. And the sorcerer's apprentice goes like, no, stop. Battles around with his, with, uh, with his wand. But unfortunately, he doesn't know the spell to stop the broom. He only knew the one to like animate it. So he goes like, okay, I have to stop this broom. And if, if magic doesn't work, I'm going to use brute force. So he grabs a nearby axe and he smashes the broom and it all splinters all over the place. And it looks like the, the problem is solved. But, oh my God, all the splinters like erect themselves up and form smaller brooms themselves who again run off and fetch even more water. So applying like the, the emergency solution actually made things even worse. So he, he really doesn't know what, what to do. He just can stand by the, and watch the brooms like flooding the place. And he, there's absolutely nothing he, he can do. And he just stands there and cries, who can help me? Who can help me? And just in time, the master returns, looks at all the mess and says like, Whoosh, broom, Go back to just be like a simple, uh, simple tool, and all the brooms instantly like, like reassemble into into the big one and lay flat on the floor, and the situation is solved. And the sto the the moral of the story is: do not tinker with powers that you do not understand, because some things people, uh, so, some th sometimes things seem to be really easy, like. Just apply with this small uh, magic spell here, but actually it doesn't work like that. You have to know what you're doing. And this is what this talk is all about. Think, do not tinker with powers that you do not fully understand. In embedded Linux, this actually means like, don't base your product on things that you do not understand, because, but just because they feel like magic and they just worked out of the box. That, that's really bad. So, my name is Joseph, and hopefully I can help you to not be the sorcerer's apprentice in, uh, in this entertaining, hopefully entertaining,
but a bit short um, introduction. Usually my presentations are really, 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 really interactive, which means that uh, I'll, I'll make the audience stand up and sit down and wave hands and I throw chocolates. Sadly, this doesn't work in a vir virtual context. So because I already have a like a pile of chocolates behind the webcam, I'm not going to do it today. So we, we might get to a point where I ask you to do some reactions, but you can throw like questions at me at any time. I, I am always in for a good discussion. I will be around afterwards for, for talking to each and every one of you in the, in the chat. So really, whenever you feel like um, talking or criticizing or praising or proposing to me, I'm in for anything, really. I just, I just love to talk to people. Okay, that, that was the te technical side of the presentation. Now it's the personal side. Um, currently, or since, since February, I am head of developer relations at Mender.io, um, which is one of the products of Northern Tech. This, this is an uh, over-the-air update solution. This is what, what I actually do for a living. I talk to people about making cool stuff, which is just like awesome. Beyond that, I am a Yocto project ambassador, which means that I hold some functional like roles and responsibilities for, for the Yocto project. I do a lot of outreach. I talk about it. I present. Um, I run social media. I actually also do this for the Open Embedder project, which is like the community side as well as the underpinnings of uh, the Yocto project. So there's a kind of like overlap there. You might have uh, seen me or met me in one of those contexts too. And completely unrelated, I am community hero for Gitpod, which is, in a nutshell, VS Code plus Docker plus a lot of steroids in the cloud. This is awesome. If it fits your, if it fits your use case, it does for some of mine. So whenever you feel like talking about some, some of those things, just get in touch with me. As I already told you, this is a tour through my own life. So this means whatever can go wrong. In, and I, I'm talking about in the slides, I actually did it wrong myself. And I will share the learnings and the occasions with you. Beyond that, you, it's really, really easy to get in touch with me. Shoot me a mail, tweet me. Um, I am here in the, in, in the chat. Just you, you will find a way. I'm, re I'm really good to, uh, to like um, approach. And I think we can start. Mystery number one, manual compilation. You know, um, in Embedded, we often do cross-compile. And this um, might or might not work. Ah, good point for reactions. Who of you remembers the, the good old triple step of configure, make, make install? Awesome. I've got, I've got an awesome audience. A lot of you understand it. So. Um, Let's take it one step further. Who tried to do this and it didn't work because you needed to do it for a cross compilation target? I, I see we're on we're on the same terms. So the usual the usual thing that people would do then is like, oh, it doesn't cross compile because whatever. So yeah, it's just gonna gr uh, grab my embedded target and uh, compile it. And there, and this is what actually will happen. You do the first cross compile and target, which both rips it out of the original setup. And unfortunately, it even stacks up because everything that comes after the, the, the manual cross compile will also have to be manually cross compiled in the target because your original build process won't see it. This means a number of really, really bad things. Um, it is mostly undocumented unless for, I'll tell you in a second, it's because this is enter this command, configure, magic, make. This command, like magic, do this. So you usually end up with something that is dependent on the person who actually does it on the target. And in a nutshell, it is completely unreproducible. My personal sin with this, when I was doing my uh, master's thesis, or the equivalent in, uh, in Germany, I faced the same stuff. And I had no idea, and I just 
Yeah, I said, I'll compile in the target. And I ended up with literally three pages handwritten worth of compile instructions for whatever packages uh, with a carefully handcrafted order of everything to, to, to say and do. And even with the package versions, because everything else would just break. And it, it was a mess. And I tell you, this is, this is no fun because especially, you can see the bottom line, the next time something has to be changed in one of the middle things, you have to do it all over again. And it probably won't even build back then because one, one little bit that you had not properly documented, you will have forgotten by then. What to do, what the source sells, automate everything. Always use a proper build system that makes all of your operating system and application stack. This might bring um, a serious learn learning curve, which is, seems prohibitive even at times because you have to be paid during your, your learning, but it is all worth it. It is, it is just like, this is your lifesaver in when you're doing embedded. Uh, you might do, you might pick anyone, anything, as long as it's, it's an automated build process. You can do anything open embedded derived, mainly something from the Octo project. You can go for build root, which has a slightly different use case, but it's also very, very powerful. You can go for ESA, which is a reproducible build mechanism for Debian, or Pete the Extist, who is, has a even more like niche, but also very, very powerful use case. Whatever you use, I don't care. Just don't stack up commands all by yourself. Which brings me almost to the next thing. Once we have completed our build, we have, have it on, on, on the target. And you say, like, yeah, there's this, this small thing that I just need to tweak and tweak that other one. And then we're ready to go. So it's all, only in that target. So you essentially drop, dump the memory out of it. And so like, I copy it, let's copy this on all production devices and we're good to go. And no, just don't do it. Things that might happen, you might actually accidentally ship things that you put in there just for testing something. Prominent um, example was a couple of months back where a company that makes automated door locks uh, shipped a Bruno Mars MP3 on their door locks. Because for whatever reason, one of the developers said like, ah, this is cool to test. I'll have it in there. And they were like, no idea. So you will forget stuff. You will also forget stuff that you did in order to make the golden image. This is, this is somewhat related to the build process. Um, whenever you have manual interaction on the next iteration, something will be different and it will break stuff in non-reproduced way, non ways. Even worse, if you have in your golden image some debug stuff, like debug binaries, debug um, logs, whatever. And if you do not deactivate that, you ship devices with, um, uh, with activated debug is, might, might, bad, might be bad for the uh, endurance of your memory, but even worse, if it exposes some uh, debug, debug port or whatever, like, God forbid, Telnet, if, it, uh, if you actually ship this, then you have just deployed a perfect backdoor with, with your device. And no, this is, this is just not good. Nobody wants backdoors. My personal sin with this is not that grave as shipping a backdoor, but I had a device which featured a partition layout that started out with U-boot and then environment and then some rescue file system and then came the actual payload. And I was too young and too inexperienced to understand how I could like automatically pre-assemble all of this. So I took exactly the golden image approach. I got myself a device. I flashed U-boot, I flashed the, um, the environment, I flashed the rescue file system, and I dumped it again, and I handed that off to production. Guess what? Five years in, something on the hardware changes, and what did I do? I looked at it and said, like, I have no idea what I did back then. Can't I get away somehow without doing all the magic again? 
So, so the lesson is, again, just like in, in the first mystery, the build system is not just about the cross compilation. The build system is about really making the thing that goes onto the image. And if you have learned your build system the proper way, you can handle variations in the hardware. You can handle variations in the software. And once you do it rightly, you can have your build, create the artifacts, which is, which is another name for like binary stuff usually, not exactly, but in, in embedded Linux, artifact often refers to a binary thing. And you just push them straight through your whatever um, pipeline you do, um, you do uh, your testing, hopefully, and then go straight to, to production. No manual interaction whatsoever, please. When we are talking about build systems, and I actually mentioned um, Ubuntu for uh, for a moment. No, I, I mentioned ISA for a moment in order to to create Debian derivatives. This is this is probably the one that the one mystery that I am only semi guilty of myself. Um, because when you're when you're working on on a desktop situation, and it's just like, oh, I need I need that one, and it's in this repository. Yeah, sudo apt-get install whatever. And so a lot of people think, oh, now this Yocto thing is such so super complete, uh, just so super complicated for me. Um, well, it supports package managers, right? So we just add this, and then we can add the Ubuntu repositories, and then we'll be all set. And uh, no. This is just not true because distributions and especially embedded distributions are about API and ABI. They, they define how your system behaves and looks to the application. And it's not about the name of the package management. You, you can use RPM, you can use Debian, I don't care. But the, that, those are just file formats. They store artifacts in whatever way and then you can you, the the system consumes them, whereas the distribution and this people do really confuse is about how does libs look, what can I link to. So whenever you try to do something like that, first you will waste your time, which is probably not my concern, but I'm trying to be helpful. So after wasting all the time, I personally hope that you don't get it working, because that's the easy way out. If you never get it working, you are frustrated, you stop it, and every, no, nobody gets harmed. If you actually have to get it working, like accepting so, something from a, uh, from a package repository, you'll end up with a lot of errors. Sometimes right during the installation, but probably worse, trying to execute it. Because, as I said, it's ABI, API. Um, the libraries don't align, the architectures might only semi-align, you end up with a hell of errors or sec faults, and it, it will just burn your time and it will not work in the end. Don't do that. Personal sin here, when I did not know about things like that, um, I thought, oh yeah, there's this, there's this package that's available in, in uh, RPM, but not on my Debian machine. And at the time I met uh, a Debian developer, over a drink in an evening. And I said, yeah, sorry, but isn't there some magic to uh, use an RPM uh, build right on your on your Debian machine? And I said, yeah, there's this thing called Alien for for RPM. And isn't there something for uh, for Debian? And he just looked at me with, a, with that blank stare and uh, said like, are you kidding me? So, by that time, I realized I'm probably on the wrong track. I already pointed this out. A distribution is ABI API. Whatever is in the file, that's just like a tarball or an, a zip or whatever. It's not about the payload. Don't mix binaries. It just won't work. It will hurt you. Why do I always get the rest? Right click. Mystery number four. Once we actually have successfully built a device, which works, the software runs, then we deploy it to production. And as we all know, there are, there are devices that need something done. Setting a MAC address, setting a host name, setting a customer name, setting um, a whatever key. 
And then you probably are inclined to go to production and say, ah, that's, that's no problem. You just attach the serial cable and you type those four easy commands you and just um, that's it. Totally no problem. This is what actually will happen. Um, somebody on your manufacturing floor who does not happen to be an embedded Linux professional will repeat those steps over and over again. Something happens which is not exactly as you um, told them. Maybe the color of the prompt changes. Maybe the prompt itself changes. There is an error. There's a warning, whatever. So they will just say, this is not how it should be. And they will call you. And the more um, devices you build, the more often they will call you. Because they will all, it, it, this, this is just like, uh, um, what's, what, what's the word? It correlates. More devices, more problems. Just like that. And it doesn't scale at all. Do the math. If somebody can manufacture the steps, just just these 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 like four commands in one minute on your device, and you're shipping like 10k devices of that brand per year, which is okay-ish for a medium scale embedded product, then you can do the math, and that says, yeah, cool man, you just wasted a complete month's salary. Or some poor poor dude who sits in the manufacturing floor doing that all over again. And if you try to do something, including plugging in, typing, unplugging, and checking in one minute, that's about nothing. You can you can really just like type echo hello world. You probably won't get any further. So you probably end up wasting a lot of more time and therefore a lot of more money. My personal sin with this also first product when we got it out. I said, like, yeah, here's this four funny commands uh, you just have to type. Actually, it was a little bit more. It involved flashing firmware. It involved setting the host name. It, it involved erasing RAM, uh, uh, ROM. And it was probably like 10 or 15 minutes. And yeah, I got away with it because um, we did not sell big numbers of this device. And it was a good lesson. Um, but for the next one, um, we we went up to a couple of K per year and that just wouldn't scale at all. So whatever needs to happen to the to the device in a in a in like inter in a, in a configuration or modification way, make sure it can be either done automatically during manufacturing, provisioning. You you don't want to touch every device. It needs to come from, from hard, hardware manufacturing, testing, flashing, automated configuration, provisioning, go. That's it. I don't, want, I don't want to see anybody touching devices manually. And once you're out in the field, you also have to be aware that there are things that you need to change. And you have to provide your users with a way to actually do that that does not involve attaching serial cables because nobody will attach an, in, uh, a serial cable and nobody will understand the prompt. So whatever you need to do, make sure that you can either do it automatically over the air or in, in an automated way. And therefore we come to the, to the last big mystery and I already mentioned it, do something over the air. Updates are just one thing that you usually want to do over the air and once you finished your device and you need to get it out, and then like two days before you actually do it, somebody says, yeah, but we also need to be able to update it in the field. And then you go like, yeah, that's, that's no problem. That's just a binary and we just drop it on the ROM. That's just like two, uh, two or three lines of flash, uh, of bash. And this is what really will happen. In the best case scenario that you, that you actually do, or that you can actually encounter. You run the update process for the first time and your, and your device completely fails right at your manufacturing floor, like bricked even in-house. This is the best case because then you inst instantly realize, no, this does not work. I need something else. If you are a little bit less lucky, then um, the device goes out and in some cases it fails pretty early, which means that you're probably in the, in the early time of the product 
and the devices are not yet shipped to all over the uh, all over the planet and you can you can still react you can go out fix those and be safe if you are if things go worse then you end up with devices that are bricked in the field or even later so no nobody wants devices that are just dead once once an update arrives this is what what you really need need to avoid and in the in this case it really it really gets nasty because then lawyers and uh, penalty fees will be involved and the absolutely worst case that can ever happen is you roll out updates that seem to work but actually are like corrupted or defective in some whatever way so the user doesn't notice it you don't notice it you think everybody's fine and Maybe you're doing industrial controls and sometime, and then after a couple of months, somebody comes to you and says like, you know, I've got this machine there. It's worth a couple of hundred K and it's, it, it just broke. And we think this is because the software um, was corrupted and this is because you, you made bad updates and then you're in for the fun. Who, who pays for the damage? My personal fail is probably somewhere in the one or uh, second stage. I thought this is easy. I implemented a couple of lines of bash. And because I'm a good guy, I tried to make sure that my uh, updates are like uh, integrity is, is, uh, is checked. So I checked it with the GPG. And we, we, we rolled it out, out. And literally, the first device that hit the customers, it fell over. Reason, GPG is um, tied to, to timestamps of the, of the certificates. And those customers would try to update the devices without actually connecting them to the network. They would just use a flashcard. And GPG would say, well, I've got, I don't have any, any timestamps, so I'll presume it's, uh, it's Unix standard time. So first, first. 1970 oh the certificate is just way too much in the future it must be fake um no this is not this is not a, a good sign this is not verifiable um no go so really do not ever homebrew your update mechanism use something that is out there you can use sw update you can use os tree you can rock or you can talk, talk to me and use Mender.io. Whatever fits your bill, there are differences in order of IB updates. Does it come with a backend? Does it come with management? Um, what anything is better than doing it yourself in Bash? I promise. Of course, I'm happy to see you in 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 the Mender crowd because this is really something something uh, battle tested, super robust, and we come with uh, with an end to end solution. Which means you do, we don't we do not only provide the, the client integration but also the whole pipeline. But whatever fits your bill, please use it. So conclusion: the master sorcerer says magic is sometimes dangerous but useful because once you have actually understood the mechanisms behind the magic. And this is what, what the sorcerer does for magic. And this is what we engineers do for embedded Linux. Once we have understood the system, the lifecycle, the software, and the things that can happen, then we can make awesome things. And we have to realize if we do not know something and just ask the people that have done things before. With that, please feel free to ask me. If you ever want to know more about what I talk about when I'm not talking about um, uh, avo avoiding beginner fails, then it's Mender.io. Just a real shot. We are easy to contact. Find a lot of information on GitHub. I thank you very much. I probably do not have any time for Q&A because I'm at exactly half of the hour. Thanks, everybody, for inviting me. I'll be back in one and a half hours. And I'll hop right over into the chat room where you can totally approach me right now if you want to discuss something.